you all tonight. And can you please say to the person beside you, you're a real man. You're a real hope. Okay. <laughs> it's really a joy for men to gather together like this, right? Walang ibang makakaunawa sa lalaki kundi kapwa lalaki. Nobody can understand a man except a man. And yet, because of our own problems and struggles and insecurities, sometimes it's so difficult to open up to other men for fear that we may be looked down or rejected or even sometimes condemned. And yet we realize all of us share common struggles, common hurts and wounds. And that's why it's time together to come together and be able to help each other become better men. We are not perfect men, but we choose to learn and become better men by the grace of God. Can we say that together? We are not perfect men, but we choose to learn and become better men by the grace of God. You know, history begins to change when men begin to take up their divine calling and purpose to be shapers of the nation and shapers of the generations to come. In fact, God's in, uh, in the Bible, we see that God always begins with a man. When God is about to effect change in history, he will always begin with a man. And for those of you who know the Bible, you know that from the very book of Genesis, God always starts with a man. God created Adam before he created Eve, and he made a covenant with Adam before Eve was created. His whole purpose was invested in the man and expected the man to take leadership of the woman, his wife. But of course, we know that is where the man failed right from the very beginning. The fall of man is really the product of the failure of Adam to take full leadership over his wife. And that is why we often say, leadership and manhood are synonymous. As you develop your your leadership qualities, you develop your manhood in the eyes of God. Not all leaders are men, but all men were meant by God to take leadership, beginning in our own families. Okay? So tonight, we're going to go back a little bit to the values and the core values of our movement. Men of Integrity International is a place where men help men become better men. Okay, Bayon? Okay? So we are men helping each other become better men. Ed Cole said, becoming male is a matter of birth. Becoming a man is a matter of choice. We don't become men simply by biological birth. In fact, sabi nga po ni Dr. Ed Cole, one of the reasons why there's so much failure in society is because there are more boys out there than there are real men. It's a very bold statement by Ed Cole, but it is true. The reason why there's so much failure in society is because there are more boys out there than there are real men. And because of a wrong concept of manhood that we were read up in in the Philippines, the machismo uh, concept, and we have discussed that in the conference, we have not really fully understood the full meaning of what it means to be a man, but we were reared up in an ideal that actually brought out the worst in us. So many homes have been broken and damaged because of the machismo mentality. So many men fail to really grow up to their full potential because of machismo mentality. And that's why we need to find out what is the true definition of manhood. And we began to see in our conference that what summarizes God's definition of manhood is already in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Only God who created us has the right to define who we are. Okay? And in Micah 6, 8, we read this. He has showed you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. There are three core values here. Number one is integrity. To act justly means to, to do what is right in the sight of God and men. And then the second one is mercy. Actually, the word mercy in the original language carries the idea of faithful love and commitment to others. And it can also be understood as mercy or compassion for others. And that begins in our family, our love for our family, our love for our wife and our children. That's where that begins. And finally, to walk humbly with your God, which is the very foundation of manhood, which is spirituality, to walk humbly with your God. 
You see, when God created Adam, the very first thing he did was to put him in the garden, the place of intimate fellowship with God, before he created the woman. God wanted to have relationship with the man, to have fellowship with him, because it is in that relationship that the man draws his strength to fulfill God's purpose for him. And that is why spirituality is the foundation of our integrity and our compassion for other people. What is the purpose of this movement? It is to mentor men for effective godly leadership and influence in the home, the church, workplace, community, and the nation. So the purpose of this movement is to help mentor men. You know, the sad thing is that almost all of us were never mentored in terms of what manhood really means, right? Even our fathers did not know what it makes, means to be a real man. Often their, their concept of manhood is being macho, okay? And uh, that means uh, uh, being always ready to defend your ego when somebody hurts you. And sometimes that can be violent and reckless. Or sometimes by demonstrating your sexual virility by impregnating women. The more women, the more macho you are. And that is why this has already brought a lot of damage to all those areas in the home. Even leaders in the church sometimes fall into temptations to adultery. In the workplace, okay, community and the nation. What is our goal? Our goal is to fulfill the requirement of God in Micah 6 8 to build men characterized by spirituality, integrity, and compassion. Can we say those three words? Spirituality integrity and compassion no nation can be greater than the kind of man it produces each man and that's you is a seed of future generations and his character determines the character of future generations you see when God looks at us as men he doesn't look at you only as an individual he looks at you as a generational person because how you live your life today is going to affect generations to come. I don't know if you have noticed that in families where adultery takes place, you will notice that the next generations, you'll find adultery taking place at every generation. Okay? And integrity practice in one generation will be carried on to generations to come. You see, what, how we live today in the face of our children, in the face of the youth of our time, influences their understanding of what it means to be a man and that is why we have a great role to play because we are the seeds of future generation our character determines the future in fact a Beijing academic he is a, a academic thinker once said the struggle for our character is the struggle for the nation's character and me repeat what this Beijing academic thinker said the struggle for your own character is a struggle for the nation's character because our character is going to affect others around us. And if you want to have a godly nation, it has to begin with me modeling that kind of character I want to see in the nation. And this is what I was sharing a while ago, Ed Cole, author of Maximize Manu, the reason why families fail and societies fall is because there are more boys out there than there are real men. And we'll see in a little while later on what it means to be a man. God's purposes for the nations always begins with a man. A man that will model and carry out his mandate for his generation and the next ones. Can you look at the man beside you and tell him, you're affecting future generations. <laughs> Let's do a good job. <laughs> okay. I shared this in the conference, but let me review it for a while. What is the mandate of God for men? The primary mandate of God for men is already modeled to us by his purpose for Abraham. Let me share this with you. Abraham, God said, will surely become a great and powerful nation. And all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Do you want to be a blessing to the nation? Right, okay. And all nations on earth will be blessed through him, for I have chosen him. So can you say to the person beside you, God has chosen you as a man? Okay. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children 
and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. And what did he promise him? That he will be a great and powerful nation. This is a powerful lesson here. And the lesson here is this, that the foundation of the building of a great and godly nation is the father-son relationship. That's where everything begins. We cannot therefore neglect how we relate to our sons and to our children. Because whether we like it or not, whatever they have seen in us, whatever has affected them from the way we live, in, from our convictions, from our values, are going to affect theirs in their generation. Fathers are not just rearing up children. They are building a nation through them. And we need to understand this. When you look at your children, you're talking about generations to come. And what kind of generation they will be affects the future of the nation. How many of you are tired of all the corruption and the evil in our generation? How many are tired? Okay. You know, we need to be so desperately tired enough to do something about it. And what can we do? Because there are powers that be that control the decisions of many at the top. But you know, you don't have to wait for change from the top to take place. Change can begin where everybody comes from. Every up, everybody up there came from down here. And we can start the change down here by beginning to focus on building a next generation that will truly be a true generation of hope for the, for the nation. How many have heard of Thaksin Shinawatra? former Prime Minister of Thailand, Thaksin Shinawatra. Thaksin Shinawatra said, every politician looks to the next election. A statesman looks to the next generation. If we focus on the next generation, we can do a lot of change. Do you believe in what he said? You see, politicians are always thinking about the next election. What differentiates a politician from a statesman is that a politician is more concerned about maintaining his position and power, while a statesman is more focused on the good of the people and willing to sacrifice himself in order to alleviate the suffering of the poor and to build the right values in the people. A statesman is somebody who will serve the people at the sacrifice of himself. And a statesman knows that the only way you can build a better future for any nation is to focus on inspiring the next generation. One of the statesmen that I have personally known is no other than Dr. Rovito Salonga, former Senate President. There was a time that God has given me the privilege to work with him. In an advocacy we started in Manila called Building a Nation of Character. He became my personal advisor. And I've learned so much from the wisdom of this man. In fact, he once confided with us, and it's okay to share this with you because you know, you know what has been happening in our country. He said, do you know why I left the Senate? And I said, why? Because the Senate is dead. That is not the kind of Senate we started before. There's a lack of integrity, a lack of real vision for the people. And that's why I left the Senate. I learned a lot from him. And I just wish that, you know, he's not a perfect person. But the wonderful thing about Dr. Salonga is that he has learned so much that he's able to impart great wisdom. His passion is to bring about change by focusing on the next generation. What he's been doing all these years is mentoring lawyers. St lawyers who are still studying law. He will bring them to his uh, center and then he will mentor them. He believes that the only hope of the future are these young people. And he's willing to invest his life to mentor them with all the wisdom that he has learned through the years. He is truly a statesman because he focuses on the next generation. And I tell you, we as men can do a far better job than what Hovito Salong is doing because God has entrusted to us our sons and our children to mentor them in the right convictions and values that will make the biggest difference in their lives so that they become a, make, a, make a difference for their generation. It all begins with us today. 
That's why we are not just rearing up children, we are building a nation through them. You see, there's even a warning in the Bible, and this is in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 to 6. Look, God is saying, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. What is God saying? If the father-son relationship is not restored, it's going to jeopardize my purpose for a nation. Because the foundation of the building of a great and godly nation is that father-son relationship. And if that is not restored, that is not reconciled, I will strike that land with a curse. You understand this? Our role as men and as fathers of the next generation play a central part in God's purpose of building godly and great nations. And that is upon us to focus on because we know there is no other way. There is no other way. This is God's way of changing a nation. It begins with you and me as men of our generation. That's why Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, the righteous man lives for the next generation. When you pursue integrity in your life, you're not doing that for yourself, you're doing that for the next generation as that will influence their life because they're always looking for role models to follow. The next generation cannot be a hope for the nation if they do not have enough role models to inspire them to the right values and convictions. The compromises of one generation will surely lead to the corruption of the next. History has proven this over and over again. We, we compromise today, we corrupt our children in the next generation. But the integrity of one generation will lead to the empowerment of the next to become a generation of hope. You know, we have so many superstars and celebrities right now, right? What the nation needs are not more celebrities, what we need are more heroes. And heroes are people who think less of themselves and willing to sacrifice for the good of the majority. And I tell you, we need to be those heroes now for our next generation so that they become the heroes of their generation. One of the areas that we need to build integrity as men, where most of us are struggling right now, and some of us have already fallen one way or another, and one area of our integrity that has the most powerful impact on the next generation has something to do with our sexual integrity. Today we see a society where there are so many broken homes. We see a society where there are so many single mothers. And we are seeing a population of children that we may call a fatherless generation growing up with no father to mentor them, no father to teach them. Can you imagine what the future will be like if we continue to produce fatherless generations? Who's going to discipline them? Who's going to teach them the right convictions and values? And this is happening because there are a lot of men who struggle and oftentimes fail in the area of maintaining sexual integrity. And this is where I would like us to focus tonight. I say this, covenant eyes. Can I say covenant eyes? This is a phrase I want you to remember. Covenant eyes, building sexual integrity. This is taken from the statement of Job, one of the righteous men in the Old Testament. And Job, in fact, received accolade from God himself when God boasted to the devil, Have you seen my servant Job? There is no one righteous like him on the face of the earth. Can God say that of us today? Can God say that of us today? Behold my servant, there is none righteous like him on the face of the earth. And here in Job 31.1, we find the secret of the integrity of Job. You see, Job made a covenant at the most sensitive area of his manhood because this is the area where most of us fail and fall. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look at a girl with lust. This is the secret of his integrity. 
if we can deal with our eyes, we can deal with any other thing in our life. Because as men, our greatest weakness is what our eyes see. Right? And if we do not know how to control those eyes, our manhood will soon be damaged by the wrong choices we'll be making. And therefore, we will bring damage to the next generation. Not only that, we also find in Deuteronomy 24.5 that is God's purpose for man when he gets married. How many are married here? Can you raise your hands, please? Yes, okay. God's purpose for marriage is clearly revealed here. And let me explain what God means here. A newly married man must not be drafted into the army or be given any other official responsibilities. He must be free to spend one year at home bringing happiness to the wife he has married. Is it the will of God that once you marry a woman, that your priority is to make your wife happy? Okay? Many married couples get, many people get into the marriage relationship with the wrong reason. I often ask couples before I wed them, why do you choose to marry this guy? Why do you choose to marry this girl? And they will say, well, because she has this quality or he has this quality that makes me happy. In other words, people marry because the other person makes him happy, right? What if the person no longer makes you happy in the course of the marriage? We have a problem here, Houston, okay? Because the very basis of the decision to get married is already wrong. You marry because you love the person, and you love the person, that means that you're committed to her happiness above your own. It's not about your happiness here. That's part of it, but that's secondary to your decision to be the person who will make this woman happy for the rest of her life. That is what love is all about. You understand this? And that's why God himself wants to galvanize that in a man who just got married. He said, for the first year, you will have no other focus than to bring happiness to your wife. Why? Because from God's perspective, if you develop the habit of putting the happiness of your wife above your own for one year, that habit will protect you from adultery for the coming years. Are you still here? We are always the product of our habits. Our habits define us. Our habits define our future success or our future failure. Every major failure is the product of building the wrong habits along the way. And every major success is the product of building the right habits along the way. And that's why God, at the very beginning of a marriage, wants the man to develop the right habit. I want you to focus on bringing happiness to your wife for one year because once that happens, in the next years, that will already be a habit in you. So that by the time you're tempted to look at another woman, and because you're so used to putting the happiness of your wife always above, wala kang time para entertaining yung babae kasi you already developed the habit of putting the happiness of your wife always above yourself. You understand that? And I mentioned last time that the reason why men adulterate is because we are now more concerned about our happiness than the happiness of our wife. That's why we adulterate. And that's why this is already establishing to us a solid foundation for fidelity in marriage that will make your marriage last for a lifetime. And that is, my focus is the happiness of my wife. And when I look at another woman, I refuse to look at any other woman with lust. It's a, cha it's a choice that I make all the time. You see, our habits define us. It is the accumulated effect of our habits that determine our ultimate success or failure as men. Every major success in life is the product of years of building the right habits. Every major failure, particularly marital failure, the result of building the wrong habits. Jim Rohn, one of America's most sought after and most respected business advisors and motivational guru, said failure is not a single cataclysmic event. You don't fail overnight. Instead, failure is a few errors in judgment repeated every day. It's about our habits every day. He also said we must all suffer from one of two pains. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. The difference is discipline weighs ounces while regret weighs stones. You know, to be able to discipline how you look at other women if you're married. Or if you're single, to discipline how you look at a girl. And applying the discipline also in your private life. 
that we don't dwell so much time in fantasizing sexual things or engaging ourselves in pornographic material. That demands discipline. You understand that? It takes a lot of discipline for you when you go into the internet to prevent yourself from going to pornographic sites. Because you can go there with just a touch of a button. It takes discipline to keep you from doing that. And if discipline is painful, why? Of course it's painful, right? Because it's denying yourself the pleasure of the, the thing you really want to do. But the pain of discipline is lighter than the pain of regret that later on when we are conditioned by these things to lead us into decisions that can affect a lifetime like falling into adultery the pain of regret will be more severe than the pain of discipline okay the true measure of a man is not the success of his profession but the success of his marriage his true character is tested by the strength of his marital integrity no other success in life can compensate for failure in the home, as David McKay said. A marriage vow is no match to passion where there is no strength of character. And there is no strength of character where there is no fear of God or love of God. That's why we're saying spirituality is the foundation. The more you seek God with all your heart, the more you build a strong relationship with God, the more you pray and seek God's grace each day, to empower you to overcome the temptations we face as men every day and to learn to consciously walk in the awareness of God's presence in your life every day enables you to develop the courage and the strength to overcome temptations no man is stronger than the tenacity of his convictions tenacity means uh, you know, enduring determination that no matter what happens, I will not sacrifice what I believe in. You cannot be stronger than the tenacity of your convictions and the depth of your spirituality. The deeper you walk with God, the stronger you become. Let me tell you a story. There was a story of a cargo plane that was carrying a lot of fruits and vegetables. At a certain level, one of the crew members discovered that uh, there were rats in the cargo bay and the rats were threatening the cargo of fruits and vegetables and so some one of them said we have to kill the rats before they get to the cargo or we'll be the one to pay for this cargo but the pilot said no don't kill them because by trying to kill them you might you might damage a part of the plane and we'll all be in trouble and so they said so what are we going to do and so the pilot said, just sit back, put on your seat belts, and be ready for the oxygen mask to come down. We'll just bring the plane to a higher altitude where there will be less oxygen, and that will kill the rats. And that's exactly what they did. And when they were at a very high altitude, they were all donning gas oxygen masks, the rats died. Sometimes fighting against those temptations in your life will all the more draw you to those temptations. But the other way is to build a stronger relationship with God, to soar higher in your spirituality. To learn to dwell in the awareness of God's presence in your life. To learn the fear of God. That is a better way to overcome the rats in our life. There is no substitute to spirituality in strengthening our resolve against sin. Weak men like leaves are swayed by the opinion or the accolade of others. Madali po tayong madala ng the, sinasabi ng barkada or peer group. Or the accolade of others, wow, good, good. But you're already sacrificing your conviction in order to gain the accolade or the applause of men. Or the attractions of women or wealth. You see, weak men like leaves are swayed by the attractions of women and wealth. Let me tell you one secret about women. I've been a counselor for many years. I've counseled men and women. You know, women will always test a man. How far you will go. Okay? Your wife, as you have noticed, there are times she will test you. How you will react if she does something. 
Because women are always looking for strength in the man that they admire or they love. And they want to stand, test your strength. Can you handle her? Can you handle her tantrums? Can you handle her nagging? Can you handle her being emotionally sensitive? What they're looking for is enough strength in the man to make them feel they can really lean on you because they see you can handle them well. Not by force of violence, but rather by understanding and patience and meeting their needs so that they don't have to tell you what they need. That is where we are being tested. And I tell you, women, if you are not careful, especially those who are bold and courageous to truly sedu seduce you, they're going to test you. And I tell you, women lose respect for men who are easily swayed by their attractions. They soon lose respect. Okay? But they enjoy the attention. But the respect of you has grown less. Because they see you are not strong enough. Do you understand this? That is why when we are easily swayed by att attractions of women or the attractions of money and wealth, it demonstrates that we are yet weak men. Strong men stand because they are anchored on uncompromising convictions. Even if a woman comes to you and seduces you, say, I'm sorry, I love my wife. Goodbye. That takes a lot of conviction. And conviction is a habit where you make repeated choices to resist the temptation and it becomes a habit in you. And when it becomes a habit, that becomes what you call conviction. You see, belief is something that you hold. Conviction is something that holds you because it has become habit in your life. Every time we give in to temptation, we become weaker and weaker and weaker as men. It is our challenge to say no. And if you have to run, run. Because in the story of Joseph in the Bible, real men know when to run. Right? They don't run away from challenges and trouble, but they know how to run away from a woman. Those are real men. Okay. Let me share with you how David, the great king, fell. And we will see some guidelines here on how we can keep ourselves also from falling. How many of you know the story of King David in the Bible? Okay. What was his greatest fall? Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. Don't forget the murder. Because God is faulting David in the, in the story of the kings primarily for his murder of Uriah. Okay? So... How did David fall? First of all, David built the wrong habits. You see, God clearly commanded, especially with women, in Deuteronomy 17, 17, he commanded that the king must not take many wives, one wife only. But because it was the custom of kings, you know, in other nations, to take many wives, they called that the harem. And if a king has more women, the more popular he gets. The macho king. Okay? And David, instead of fully obeying God, allowed himself to be influenced by the practices of kings in his time. By the time he, he, he fell for Bathsheba, he had already, according to uh, this, the story, seven wives. And he also took many concubines. Concubines are simply part of the harem. These are what we call today mga kabit. But these are all virgins, singles, okay? Concubines, above his seven wives, he took more concubines by the time he fell for Bathsheba. In other words, David was already compromising, you know, in his sexual integrity before he fell for Bathsheba. He was preparing himself for his ultimate failure. How we relate with women, single women, or married women as men, the kind of habits we build with women will affect us when we come to the time of real temptation. 
If we have not built enough safeguards in our life, when the moment of the supreme temptation comes to us, we will easily give in because we already have weakened ourselves because of building wrong habits along the way. I'll give you an example. When we get used to pornography, a time will come and you're no longer satisfied with what you see. You want the real thing. You understand that? Because we have compromised with pornography, it will embolden you at the moment of weakness to seek the real thing. Because the habit has already conditioned and prepared you. Another thing, when you look at pornography, we are conditioning ourselves to enjoy sex with a woman that is not your wife. So it, it develops in us a gradual conditioning to enjoy sex only with another woman that's not your wife. A time will come when you're no longer, you're already bored with your wife because you're, you're already seeking other pleasures outside of your marriage because you've been conditioned by pornography. These are habits that prepare us for our ultimate fall. And David prepared himself. Not only that, he not only developed habits of compromise with, the, with women, but he also developed habits of compromise with power. David was already had an army with him, but because there was a certain man that he, uh, whose flocks he cared for, and later on he asked for food, and the man refused to give him food. That was Nabal. Okay? He was so angry that he wanted to kill Nabal and every man in his town. He was vindictive. He had the power to do that. But the wife of Abigail, upon learning what happened, immediately brought food to David and asked forgiveness and told David, please do not destroy your testimony by taking into your hands vengeance and violence. You have been doing right with God all this time, David, but please don't tarnish your reputation by taking vengeance against my husband. Sure, surely the Lord will vindicate you. And because of that, David was so impressed that he said, thank you for stopping me. He was already about to use power to achieve his own personal vindictive ends. You don't use power that way. And so not, later on, we find in 2 Samuel, David did allow the seduction of success to lure him to abuse of power. You know, if you look at 2 Samuel 11 that describes the fall of David with Bathsheba, and you read chapter 8 up to chapter 10, you will discover that those chapters record victories upon victories upon victories against David's enemies. In other words, by the time you get to chapter 11, David was already, you know, a great conqueror. You know, he has defeated many of the enemies. He was actually enjoying the height of the success of his career. And I often say to men, you know, the most dangerous moment in the life of a man is not the moment of failure, but it's the moment of success. When we don't know how to handle success, success can corrupt us. If we do not make ourselves accountable to others at the height of success, like David, he never even consulted with, with uh, Nathan, the prophet, when he decided not to go into battle because that was his duty as a king. He excused himself from his duty of leading the, the army into battle, never even consulting Nathan. He was without accountability at that time. He was just wanted to enjoy himself. And it was at the moment when success seduced him into making him feel he has power. That's when he fell. Let me share this with you. Womanizing is not a matter just of lust. Womanizing is about power. The power you feel over a woman, and we abuse that. We take advantage, we exploit a woman's weaknesses because we have that sense of power. It is at those moments when you are enjoying the heights of power and success that we are most vulnerable to the temptations of women. Let me repeat that. It is in those moments at the heights of the enjoyment of success or the experience of power that we become most vulnerable to the temptations of women. How many have fallen into adultery or immorality at the height of their success of their ministry or in their political career or even in their business career? 
that sense of power makes us think that we can do anything we want. And that sense of power over a woman is now being abused and exploited for our personal pleasures. That's why how we handle power and success is very important. We should never forget to give the glory to God because, you know, even though it took a lot of your energy and effort to achieve that success, God has blessed you with the favor, the strength, the ability, the network in order to help you succeed. In Psalm 127, verse 1, it said, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. In the end, success is the gift of God. Success, when you are successful, is because God gave you the favor to succeed. You find that also in Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, uh, 17 to 18. You may say to yourself, by the strength and power of my hand, I've earned this wealth for me. But you shall remember it is the Lord your God who gives you the ability to produce wealth. You must never learn, must never forget to thank God and to keep our place of humility before God at the moments of success in our life. David was not careful. That's why I'm exhorting you. There are pastors here tonight. Do not allow the success of your ministries to keep you from humbling yourself before God. Never forget to say, God, I give you all the glory. I am just a servant. Alagi ko mong sinasabi sa aking sarili, utusan lang ako ng Diyos. In Tagalog, I am just the Lord's errand boy. Kaya ba natin sabihin nyo na Tagalog, utusan lang ako ng Lord. I am just the Lord's errand boy. Whatever success we have, we always say, I am just the Lord's errand boy. We don't receive the glory because that is not ours to glory about. You see, his experience of power lured him into that seduction by a woman and over a married woman. The biggest mistake of David was that this was a married woman. And you know what happened? After he went into Bathsheba, later on, Bathsheba sent a message she was pregnant. Okay? Let me share with you the story so you can see how it happened. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of the bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty. Can you say to the person beside you, men are by nature attracted to beauty, especially beautiful women. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we are appreciative of beauty, right? But when we are focused on the beauty of somebody that's not your wife, that's a very dangerous matter. That's a very dangerous matter. Okay? David, being a man, was attracted. I think we will be hypocrites to say, I'm not attracted to any woman of beauty. We are. Okay? Are you honest and say, I do get attracted. Right? Right. Okay? David was. And so when he looked down the, you know, the roof of the palace, he saw this woman of unusual beauty, in the original language, very beautiful. Okay? Taking a bath. You know why? Because he was up in the palace, and down there, usually the bath places are in the center of the courtyard that has no roof. So anybody at a high place can see anybody taking a bath, because it, those baths have no roofs especially in a wealthy house with a courtyard, okay? And so what did he do? He looked at the woman, and that's the problem, the eyes. He started to look at the girl with lust. That's the problem, okay? Sometimes we admit that you don't, cannot avoid the first look, right? That's why we avoid the second look, right? The problem is that when the first look doesn't go away, that's the problem. And when we are used to staring or gazing at a beautiful woman, especially with a sexy body, and you don't end that as fast as you can, if you do not divert your attention immediately, that's already the beginning of falling into sin. It's how you manage your eyes. Okay? 
David took a long look that never left the body of the girl. And what follows was action. What does he do? He sent someone to find out who she was. When you begin to start to get to know the woman, that's already a dangerous matter. It's one thing to be attracted. It's nothing known to get to know the woman more. You understand that? Okay? And then what happened? He gets the woman, and what happens next? He begins to send messengers to get her. And because he is the king, the woman cannot refuse. That's an abuse of power. If you are a, if you're a manager and you have a secretary that's sexy, and you have power over her, over her salary, you can easily abuse that power by taking advantage of your control of her because you hold her salary. That's why any position of power is dangerous for us men when we are not careful not to abuse that power. Our nature, our fallen nature makes us abuse whatever power we receive. Is that true or not? The problem with David, he had the power and he used it in the wrong way. And so, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. What can the woman do? This is the king. Okay? She had just completed the purification rites after her menstrual period. Listen to this. She just finished her menstruation, which means she is? <laughs> okay? Others would say, well, usually the safe period is right after menstruation, right? How many of you know that? The safe period of a wife is right after menstruation. Yes, a number of days after the five days, she's still safe. She's not started to ovulate, right? Right? That's why David's timing was perfect. But God had some other plans. I mean... And for David, that was advantageous for her, for him. That means she's safe. Hindi mabubuntis because it's just, you know, just right after the menstruation. Okay? But what the Bible says is that she just finished her purification period after menstruation, which means many days after that. So in short, she is fertile. <laughs> okay? I don't know if David knows the rhythm method. But he did make a big mistake. Why? Because later when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, even Bathsheba was surprised. She was pregnant. She sent David a message saying, I am pregnant. I mean, even this Bathsheba was not expecting that. But God intended that to happen. In other words, God is saying, David, be sure your sin will find you out. How many of you, if you're going to be honest, you have tried to do something wrong and you thought it was the perfect time, perfect situation, nobody knows about it. Nobody knows, nobody's gonna get hurt, you know. And then you're surprised somebody gets to know about it. Jesus said there's nothing hidden that will not be made known. There is no secret that God will not expose at the proper time. That's why in Ezekiel it is said, be sure your sin will find you out. God did not allow David to go away and scath by the sin he committed. It was so grievous to God, he ensured that Bathsheba will become pregnant. Okay? And so what happens, of course, David became desensitized and never even felt any pang of guilt until Nathan the prophet many days later confronted him it's only there that he said I have sinned and as I've shared with you last conference of all the sins that a man can commit it is sexual sin that desensitizes our conscience the, fun, the conscience the fastest once you get into sexual sin your conscience quickly dies you don't even feel anymore what's wrong with it and the more you indulge it the more your conscience dies and so when you're found out, you find yourself defending yourself instead of admitting it because you don't feel any pang of guilt. 
a man enters into remorse. Remorse means feeling sorry because now you're receiving the humiliating consequences of what you did, but there's no desire to rectify it because conscience is dead. You understand that, okay? That is David. He prepared himself because he built the wrong habits along the way. But look at Joseph, the one who ran from his master's wife. Joseph made it his practice, and this is his, his habits and conviction to protect the trust given to him. His integrity and little things prepared him for integrity and greater things. You see, Joseph became a slave to Potiphar, right, in Egypt. And he guarded the trust that Potiphar had on him, that he walk, worked with complete integrity and honesty. Joseph won the confidence of his master, so much so that he made him the administrator of his whole estate. So from a regular slave, he was appointed to be the administrator of everything that belonged to his master. So that when his master Potiphar will go out, he can entrust everything to the hands of Joseph and will not worry about anything. Because Joseph was developed a habit of being faithful and refused to compromise in little things. When the biggest temptation came, when one day his master was out and the wife was there alone with him, and the wife was very beautiful. Sounds familiar, right? And the wife was the one who fell in lust with him. Okay? And so the wife started to seduce him to go to bed with him. If you were that man, and this beautiful woman, who is the wife of your boss, really is interested in you enough to drag you to bed with her, would you say yes? Well, if you understood what that meant and you're discovered, there's only one consequence. You'll lose your head. Because you just, uh, you know, touched the, the wife of a high official in the Egyptian government. You understand that? But what kept Joseph from giving in to the seduction? He said, shall I sin against my God and do this wicked thing? What was the secret of Joseph? He maintained deep spirituality. He had a strong relationship with God that made him aware that he was always in the presence of God. That's why in whatever he did, the Bible said God prospered him in everything he did because he was faithful. He walked in integrity, even in the little things. And that's why when the big temptation came, his habit of faithfulness and integrity became his shield. That's why he's able to say, No! And he was able to run from the, wife, the woman. Why? Because he developed a habit of integrity. When we choose to compromise in the little things, we are desensitizing ourselves one day to the bigger ones. Integrity begins with the little things. How you relate with your wife each day. How you seek to make her happy every day determines whether you will fall for the sin of, or temptation of adultery or not. If you're focused on the happiness of your wife each day, you are protecting yourself because you're building the right habits that pleases God. Amen? And, they, and Joseph also exhibited a spirit of excellence in everything he did. He was a man who believed in excellence in his work. He gave himself thoroughly to every job. He gave his best. And his deep faith in God earned him the favor of God and men. How do we maintain sexual integrity? Let's go now to the practical steps. Okay? Number one. Make a covenant to maintain sexual integrity or purity until your wedding day if you're single. How many of you are single here today? Okay, great. If you want to maintain sexual integrity, you have to make a commitment, a solemn pledge before God to make a covenant that you will maintain sexual purity until your wedding day. You have to build that conviction now before it's too late. Because if you don't build your life on anything, you'll go for anything. If you don't build your life on a conviction that you want to stand upon, then you'll go for anything. Why? Because you have no foundation. 
it starts with developing a conviction I will keep myself sexually pure until my wedding day that is a commitment that we need to make so one step and you may say well I have already fallen into sin well make a choice today that from this day onward until the day of your wedding if you're single I will keep myself sexually pure until my wedding day okay and for the married of course you need to make a covenant today to preserve the purity of your marriage especially by daily focusing on your spouse's happiness build the habit that God said in Deuteronomy 24 5 is necessary for you to maintain your fidelity by learning to develop the habit of putting the happiness of your wife above your own each day of your life secondly avoid regular talk with a person of the opposite sex alone or privately especially when you're married okay when you keep talking with a woman that's not your wife especially an attractive woman and that's a regular thing that's happening and you love to talk to this woman alone or privately you are placing yourself in a very dangerous ground okay or if you are single never go out on a date with your girl in a private or secluded place you're really asking for the devil to step in this is what Jim Rohn said applying the discipline the pain of discipline only cause onces but later on the pain of regret will wait on okay another thing never share your if you're married of course it's for the married never share your marital problems with the person of the opposite sex I tell you after more than 30 years of counseling those who fell into adultery this is the most common first base in all adulteries never share your marital problems with anyone of the opposite gender because you're trying to get sympathy from the girl and hindi magtatagal baka mahulog loob niya sa'yo at nahulog na rin loob mo sa kanya and that's where your fall is going to take place if you need help about your problems with the, in your marriage don't talk to a woman talk to a man talk to a male counselor but never talk to a woman about your marital problems that is the biggest no-no for a man because almost all adulteries begin right there it's where it all begins another one avoid the company of sexually motivated people first Corinthians 15 33 bad company corrupts good character or avoid places of temptation you know, if your root home every day will cause you to pass by that place that's very attractive and seductive, maybe you need to change your route. Eh, Pastor, medyo mas malayo eh. It's better na you have more, uh, uh, you have increased travel time than fall into temptation. And by the way, let me tell you this. Of all the sins we can commit, the only sin that requires radical measures is sexual sin. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 before it was said do not commit adultery but if I say to you if you look at lust with a, at a woman with lust you already committed adultery with her and then it's followed by the statement if your eye causes you to sin pluck it out if your hand causes you to sin cut it off for it's better to enter life without an eye or a hand than to be thrown into the hell of fire so what is Jesus saying? When it comes to sexual temptations or sexual sin, you have to be very radical in dealing with that because if you're not radical enough, it's not going to work. Let me repeat it again. If you want to get out of a sexual trap in your life, if you're not radical, it's not going to work. It has to be radical. It has to cause you some pain or you'll never get out of it. As I share with you, it's easy to get into sexual sin. It's very difficult to get out of it. But until you are really radical. Okay? And sometimes radical can mean if the temptation is a woman in your job. Radical can sometimes mean resigning from your job and trusting God for a new job than to continue the, uh, you know, dancing with the devil in your company. It will take that. Do it! For the sake of your family, for your own testimony, and for your relationship with God it has to be radical or it will not work avoid the company of sexually motivated people don't go out with people who love to talk about sex and having sex with girls because they're going to condition your mind 
Number five, refuse to enjoy green jokes and any kind of obscenity. How many of you hear green jokes from time to time? You know, when you begin to enjoy green jokes, there's something else. Because jokes are such that you don't forget them. Right? When somebody cracks a joke and you really enjoy it, you don't forget it, right? You usually tell it to others too, right? That's the power of a joke. That's the power of humor because it really gets into you. And so we are used to you know, listening to green jokes. Later on, you are already conditioning yourself towards exploring and trying, trying what you are hearing about because it begins to condition your mind because you're enjoying it. You understand this, okay? Number five, number six, keep away from all forms of pornography. If your computer or your internet connection is really giving you a lot of struggles with pornography, radical means have your internet cut off and try to go na lang to an internet cafe if you need it. Okay? Another, refrain from letting a person of the opposite sex ride regularly with you alone in your car. Ah, there are a number of men who do this. Okay? Whether you're married or single, Okay? If it's regularly riding with you alone in your car and bringing her to her home, you need to be very careful. If you're single and you're courting this girl, maybe that's okay. Okay? But if you're a married man and you have another woman, you know, beside you in your car, in a regular basis, that's opening the door to temptation. Many have fallen because of this. Okay? Number eight, avoid looking frequently at an attractive person of the opposite sex. The more you enjoy looking at the girl, the more you are conditioning yourself towards her. Okay? Another thing, when you are faced with sexual temptation, what do you do? Run. Flee. Don't try to resist. That's irresistible. You really have to run. All other sins in the New Testament we are commanded to resist, but only one sin we are commanded to run away from, and that's immorality. Flee immorality. You don't resist it. You flee from immorality. Okay? Another is, avoid complimenting a woman regularly unless she is your wife. You know, there are pastors who, out of goodwill, out of good intentions, uh, sometimes I love to compliment women. Oh, ang ganda mo ngayon. Oh, ang ganda ng damit mo. Oh, ang ganda ng buhok mo. Mga ganyan, ganyan. Di ba? It's okay if you do that only once. But if you do it regularly on the same person, that's very dangerous. Women are by nature attracted to people who really admire them. And if you continue doing that, you're creating an emotional attachment between you and the girl. And that can lead you later on to temptation. So, compliments men san okay lang. Pero as much as possible, reserve those words of compliment if you're married to your wife. Because your wife may be so hungry for that, but she's not getting it and you're giving it to other women. Your wife deserves the best compliment, the best words of appreciation, the best compliments of her beauty because she is the one you love. She is your wife. And she needs that. She needs to hear these words from you because she loves you. Gave all, her all the compliments but never to another woman. Number 11, avoid focusing on emotional topics with a woman or counseling her alone both for married and singles. Best to bring those matters to God in prayer together rather than make her dependent on you emotionally. If a woman keeps coming to you with her problems and you're a man, be careful. You're developing an emotional dependence. This woman will become emotionally dependent on you and that will be the beginning of temptation in your life. Understand that. Whether you're single or married, it holds for both. Okay? That's why there are many singles who have a girlfriend who later on gets into sex with a girl, her girlfriend, because the, the girlfriend had a deep problem in her life. She was struggling. And here comes the hero, the, go, uh, the, the boyfriend, trying to comfort her, and later on gets into sex. It's best 
to lead your girlfriend to God in prayer rather than trying to be the one who will comfort her instead of God. Let God bring comfort to her. Encourage her, yes, but don't make her dependent on you emotionally. Lead her to God so she will learn to depend on God, not on you. Because when the emotional dependence grows and grows, something wrong can happen. And finally, number 12, establish accountability relationships with other men. Okay, as I said, only men can understand other men, right? If you know you're, you have a certain pattern of temptation in your life, you're struggling with you know, relationship with the opposite gender, it would be good to find a man who has already had a considerable victory in that area and try to make yourself accountable so he can watch with you, monitor you. You're giving him authority to order your life according to the principles of God's word. That's what accountability means. Accountability means I'm giving you authority to order my life according to the standards of God's words. That's what accountability is. And so that means if you fail, you must report. And you have to help, you have to empower him to help you stop doing it by making you accountable to him. The best thing is to have an accountability group para mas marami kayo nagtutulungan. Let me tell you this. When men gather together to share their struggles, especially about sexual matters, you're able to bring the power of a group to help you overcome the temptation in your life. Because you cannot overcome that many times alone. You cannot. Sexual temptation is so powerful, you cannot do it alone. You need others who will embolden you, give you counsel, you know, watch you, check you. Okay, where did you go last night? And you know, every night they will check. Okay, that's a good deterrent, right? But these are people who care about you and doesn't want you to fall and continue to fall into sin. Accountability is very important. Today, we're going to have an opportunity to be part of a group. I'm not saying you're going to be accountable tonight. It's up to you. But be a part of a small group of men where you can share your life with, share yourself, and understand that these are men who have the same struggles as you have. And these are men who can understand you because you share similar experience, experiences in life. In closing, let me just encourage you by saying this. It matters not how you begin so long as you finish well. For in the end, we are judged not by what we have started, but by what we have finished. If you made many mistakes in the past, it's not the end of the story. You can still move towards a new life. And with the grace of God in your life, and with the help of other men, you can move forward and finish well in your life. Another thing, a real man will always take responsibility for his actions and his failures. When you talk to other men about your struggles, don't try to justify your sins and your mistakes by blaming your wife or by blaming somebody or by blaming that woman. The moment we make a choice as a man, we become fully responsible for the choice regardless of who started it. Once you make a choice, you become responsible before God. And that's why a real man takes responsibility for his actions and for his failures. He doesn't seek to blame others or offer excuses to justify his failures. This is what separates a man from a boy. A boy will always offer excuses. A boy will always try to find somebody to blame. That's not a man. That's a boy. Okay? Another thing, no man is a failure until he chooses to quit. The worst thing in life is not failing. The worst thing is quitting. You are never defeated until you choose to remain on the ground. You have the choice to rise up again and again and again and again until you overcome. We may not be perfect, but we can learn and become better men by the grace of God. A fall becomes a step forward if it brings you to your knees. And they stand the strongest who kneel the longest. I hope these things has been used by God to speak to our hearts, our men. Let me tell you, I had my own temptations as a man. I had my own struggles. But we are men or helping each other become better men. Right? And so, I'm going to ask you a question tonight. Are you willing to commit yourself to regularly joining this fellowship every month and find a group of men that later on you become more comfortable with 
because at the end of every session like this, you'll have small groups. And that's what we're going to do right after this. So be able to get other men to be involved in your life. Are you open to this? You can start right here. And by the way, you can choose the men you want to be with, okay? I'm sure you're sitting with people that are close to you, right? So those will be the right people.